Hello, hello. Welcome on into another episode of the Whiskey Crusaders. I'm Will. I'm Matt. On today's episode, we're talking about Jim Beam and their white label. Mm -hmm. Don't you forget to hit that like and subscribe button. Click that notification bell. Matt, can you tell me a little bit more about this uh, Beam product? Oh, yes. Jim Beam white label. Something we've actually never covered somehow on this show. So we're going to talk about the, you know, the forebear, the no world's number one bourbon. So I need to give you a little history. So prepare to relax for five more minutes of fun history time with Matt talking about Jim Beam. And then we'll get to what the hell this is. So, hey, let's go. All right, Jim Beam, founded in 1795, whose family came from Germany in, the, in 1740, was a boom prior to becoming Beam when they Americanized it, when they moved to Kentucky in 1788 to grow corn, because the government said, hey, if you move from Pennsylvania, draw rye, move to Kentucky and grow corn, which is part of Virginia at the time, because that's not confusing as hell at all. This is, but hey, whatever. You know, it is what it is. So anyway, he started making this thing called um, Old Jake Beam Sour Mash. This is his first one. Did pretty well. Uh, it was pretty popular in the locals. There was over 2,000 distillers alone just in Kentucky. So to put it that much, there's only 1,800 approximately today in America. There were 2,000 in Kentucky, which is absurd. You think about, the thing about competition back then was crazy. Granted, you weren't going very far, which is part of the reason that it was. So, of course, at that time, then they also, his son eventually, David Beam, took over. Ken the Master expanded it greatly and renamed it Old Tub because that was the name of the story was Old Tub. Not a very exciting name, but hey, whatever works for you. So, like I said, one of the other issues was it was a local business, so people bring their jugs, fill them up. Well, one of the things is you needed to have barrels. Well, people use fish barrels, vinegar barrels. are just disgusting. So they finally started charring them because, you know, who doesn't want fish in their whiskey? Because that sounds awesome. Maybe Ed. Ed might like it from the Rocket Review, but he's about the only guy I know. He'd probably drink it. He'd at least try it. So who knows? But anyway, so he, they would do that, and they, so they started charring the barrels. So then they also then moved over to Nelson County. And there was a railroad right there, so they could move it north, south, all that good stuff. Then send it down to New Orleans and all those good things, which is very, very important. All right. After that, during the Civil War, there was this great guy named uh, General Grant. And Lincoln said, hey, whatever he's drinking, send that to the rest of my generals. And he was drinking. Jim Beam was one of the things he did enjoy drinking at the time. So we got that going for him. Of course, it wasn't this particular one. This doesn't technically exist yet, but it was Jim Beam product. But anyway... Then, in 1894, Colonel James Beauregard Beam took over. Henceforth, Jim Beam is what his went by. So, he was a pretty, you know, did pretty well. Up to 1920, this thing, this, this retardist idea of, hey, let's have prohibition. Because what could be stupider than let's ruin an entire industry? Cool, great plan. So, we know how that worked out, you know, Al Capone and all those fellows. So, worked out great for them. So, at that time, uh, when it ended in 1933... In, at his ripe old age of 70 years old, Jim Bean went out there and by hand with friends and family rebuilt the entire distillery in 120 days. Because I'm sure nothing else could possibly be distilled at the time. So one of the things they learned from that was they needed yeast. So from that day on, every weekend, Jim would take home the yeast in a jug. And they, to this day, they still take it home every weekend because they're afraid of that yeast strain being destroyed. But so the same yeast strain that's in this, the same one they had in 1933. So which is very important. So in 1935, when they actually started producing this white label itself, came out, they lost the name of the old tub, so they renamed it Jim Beam at the time. So after that, then Jeremiah took over in 1946 and started shipping to Jim Beam over to our American servicemen after World War II because he doesn't want any Americans to be without their good bourbon overseas. In doing so, he created a bourbon market throughout the world, becoming the world's number one bourbon and still is to this day because of Jeremiah's foresight. Also, 1938, uh, the mint and julep became the official bur became the official drink of the Kentucky Derby, which bourbon made very popular. Uh, also, 1964, this guy named LBJ made bourbon the Native American made the America's Native Spirit. So, just a little slightly important things we're doing. Then this guy named Booker No, who we kind of like, you know, just slightly important, you know, made this thing called Booker's that we all seem to really enjoy. So, of course, he took over in 1960, which is when the downturn in spirits, but did that stop him? Hell no. He kept on producing whiskey because he's a smart guy. 1978 produced Black Label, but the thing we all like most is 1987 when he got Booker's. That came out, which is the world's first uncut, unfiltered, you know, cast strange spirit that I think we all enjoy to this day. Maybe not quite the standards of his back then, but still a good product. All right, so... And he also 92 came up the small batch collection. I know this history just keeps going on and on. At some point, you'll probably skip it, but that's fine. Anyway, so he came up with Knob Creek, uh, Basil Hayden's, and Baker's. 
After that, then his fr son, Fred Noe, took over in 1992. It's the current, it's still the current master, still with us. And his big thing has been flavored stuff. Red Stag, that came out. But he also did all these cool experiments with triticale and oat and all these other different ones. I'm not even going to name all of them. We'll cover all those eventually. He also made Apple in 2015, which is the world's number one flavored whiskey selling. So, yay, Apple whiskey. All right, so the other two things that happened in there is they also have the Still House, that is the Visitor Center, which is the big change in Kentucky. Uh, visitation was kind of responsible by Jim Bean going there. It looks like they'll saw some 1940s. They've had two major fires at Jim Bean. In 2003, they lost 15,000 barrels, which all went to the Kentucky River. And that worked out awesome, killed 19,000 fish, so super. Then they had a second one here a couple years ago in 2019, lost 45,000 barrels. This time they learned not to put water on it because that way it doesn't flow to the river. Still put some into the creeks and whatever, but not as bad. They paid some massive fines. Shit happens, I guess is what they can say. Anyway, so, you know, hey, it says, so let's tell you about this little product here, White Bean. It says white label Jim Beam here is 40% alcohol. Yay, 40%. It's four years old. It's alligator char number four. It's 77% corn, 13 rye, and 10% barley. Woohoo! Let's see what this product tastes like. And then from now on, you just refer back to this video to watch my lovely history lesson of six minutes. You're welcome. So you kind of glossed over uh, something that I think is really important that okay. they uh, are very, very true to their original yeast strain. Yes. This is um, true. Being only three products, whiskey, whiskey is water, grain, and yeast. That's it. True. So, you know, keeping one of them very, very controlled, you know, should help mm -hmm. keep your product pretty darn controlled. So I agree. I think the hardest part would be to find a four-year-old beam would be the problem from a long time ago because most of them are older. Yeah. But, you know, oh, I do have one issue with beam, which is interesting on their website. One of the things on their website says is that bourbon is required to be at least two years old. I'm like, it's not true. It's only true if it was straight. So they kind of gloss over that and they say it a second time and they're like, but well, we make it another extra two years for four years. So we don't have to say, well, you know, that we don't have to put an age statement on us because it's straight, but it's four years old. I'm like, Mm, maybe your thing's a little bit slightly inconsistent. So do it without one slight issue with their website, but whatever. All right. So let's see fibbing a little bit. Goes. They're fibbing a little bit. Exactly. So it, this smells pretty typical bourbon. Brown sugar, caramel tones, lots of vanillas. Absolutely. Yeah. Like I said, vanilla, caramel, butterscotch, a little cream soda and sarsaparilla. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, root beer. Let's see, like, um, those bottle caps, you know, those candy bottle caps, like that sugary powder that comes off of those. Yeah. To me, it's a very sugary bourbon. Yeah, it does definitely smell on the sweet side. Which is interesting. Really, at, you know, at 40, it's not exactly a, a high one. And I'm getting more towards the apple territory than cherry. Agree. Yeah, especially, um, like, a Granny Smith apple. Like a little bit, maybe like a Fuji mixed in with it. I'm not finding what's what's odd to me is that I'm not finding on the nose my typical beam marker. Which I assume is nuts. Boiled peanuts. Yeah, I don't smell I it either on, on the nose. The higher proof things that I do tend to buy, the, the Knob Creeks, the Bookers, uh, those types. Yeah, this, if it's nuts, it's like maybe a really small, faint walnut, but that's about it on the nose. Agreed, Matt. Maybe on the palate. We'll see. Let's find out. Okay. It's the the bull peanut's way more on the palate. Um, yeah. It's more sharp with alcohol vapors. A little ethanol-y. Um, look at the melon caramels. A little nail polish. It's not great. It's, it's really thin, you know, being 40%. But you still get the cream, so the root beer, brown sugar. It's, it's very spiky early. across the palate. Yeah. It um, does a, a like this. It's yeah. Yeah. Would I be would I be correct in saying that there's a pretty decent rye content in that as well? I'm getting a uh, real big thirteen percent rye, so not huge. I mean it's okay. okay. I mean, it's getting not, a nice black not, pepper in there that just kind of you know again is just part of that yeah. up and down, very very sharp journey across the palate. Salt. I think I think you kind of nailed it on that sharp. It's a uh, very alcohol forward for being only 40 percent. that's kind of surprising even has a little bit of green pepper notes as well on it 
But, you know, I mean, this is really meant to be drink with Coke. I mean, that's what this is for. Yeah. It's a mixer bourbon. Hey, I paid, I think, like 18 bucks for a 175. So, I mean, you really can't complain. I mean, you can sit back, not think about it, drink it. It's whatever. It's it's a solid product. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. There's no, you know, it's just not amazing. It's not great. I mean, we like. I think we all know we all like higher proof, non-show filled, and that fun stuff. But it's fine. I mean, clearly, if there's someone selling bourbon, they must be something right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's, it's very much down home plate for, yeah, for bourbon. It's bourbon. Plus those, those those peanut notes that we were talking about that is pretty typical bean. Like uh, it's mm. not a typical bourbon note. It's, mm. it's definitely a, more in the bean category. And I wonder if that could have to do with the specific grains they're using. It could have to do with the specific yeast they're using. It could have to do with the water that they're using. Uh, could but, be. All of the above. I don't know. But yeah, like you said, if you look for blind markers, this is always that boil peanut that we're looking for. Just like Dick on their vitamins. Mm-hmm. We look for peanuts. Yeah. But no, it's fine. I mean, like I said, I'm not going to say no. Somebody offers me a glass. This is fine. It's not. Especially on a hot day if I'm looking for something over a big cube yeah. anyway. Perfect for that. Yeah. Like that's that's what I, I you know, am kind of showing with this whiskey is a summer day. It's hot as crap outside, but mm-hmm. I still want to drink some whiskey. Yep, big cube, it's perfect. Yeah, by the pool, you know, you don't care if it gets pool water in it, it's fine, right? So it's for you, it's fine. perfect, it's fine. All right, all right. Well, don't you forget to hit that like and subscribe button, click that notification bell so you don't miss any of our upcoming videos. Speaking of which, we're live every Monday night, so come hang out with us there. Until next time, keep on crusading, put a whiskey in your glass. Cheers. I'm sure Sarah's so sad to have missed this. It mellows down a bit on the second sip. It does, but it's... I can't believe I only took one sip during that one. But I'm kind of surprised you did it. Um, it mellows down quite a bit in the second sip, but it's still very sharp and pointy. Yeah, it's not... I couldn't tell you the last time I poured Jim Bean before this. I have no idea. Yeah, I'm sure if I did, it was for someone else. It certainly wasn't for me. No, no, I couldn't imagine so.